understand I'm not American. Um, and my parents, who were both in the forces, said, don't volunteer. The only trouble is they hadn't met Courtney. Um, very, very little bit about me. Um, it, as you'll see on the thing, it's got their Viva. Now, after Matt's fabulous talk, I, I will just mention about Viva. Uh, they're an organisation based in Bristol in the UK. I'm very pleased to be a fundraiser for them. And they go undercover. Their organiser, Juliet Galatly, she started basically undercover work in the UK. And now she cannot do it anymore for the stuff that she's seen. So people who do undercover work for any sort of animal rights are fantastic. Anyway. As we've only got a few questions, we're all going to talk very slowly. Uh, but again, uh, one minute or so each, just to introduce themselves, please. Starting with Alan. <clears throat> I'm Alan Clausen. I uh, edit and publish the Northwest Examiner neighborhood newspaper for Northwest Portland. Um, I got involved because Courtney sent a press release that there was going to be a protest at the Oregon Zoo about the elephants. So that's my neighborhood. I'll go. And so I saw what was happening and I began learning more. I went through the steps that probably you've all gone through, though I was 65 before I was really learning about elephants. And uh, so I did a couple cover stories and kept on digging into this and was deeply frustrated with the way I got run around by the Oregon Zoo. Uh, but Cor Courtney told me, you know, she was most appreciative after the story came out, you know, this was very objective. And I thought, I'm not objective, I'm mad. <laughs> That's short enough? Yep, that's fine. <laughs> uh, my name's Aline Fortgang, and I'm from Seattle. And um, my background is I was in business. I owned a map company, if you can remember what road maps are. And um, after we sold our business, before it became worthless, <laughs> um, I got involved in animal rights. Um, it seemed like, you know, it, it seemed reasonable to me and made sense to me. and. I volunteered for several organizations. I was on the board of Posado Safe Haven. And um, at one point, an email came across my desk, and it was um, a protest uh, to get Bamboo the Elephant, who had been sent away from Woodland Park Zoo because she was aggressive, um, to, to get her sent to a sanctuary. And so I became involved. And um, it seemed to me, well, this is a no-brainer. I mean, elephants don't belong in a zoo. I, you know, I'd been to a zoo as a child, didn't like it. And so I thought, no-brainer, I'll get involved. And um, well, 10, 12 years later, um, still working at it, um, our elephants, unfortunately, did get sent to another zoo. But, and one died soon after arriving at Oklahoma City Zoo. But um, we're still hoping something for bamboo. Um, you know, we have thoughts, and, um, but, but our options are running slim. So in any event, um, one of the things that, that we will be doing is, is we're still working against the zoo and hopefully in ways that will make the zoo shrink and f have fewer animals there. So we continue working on animal rights. <laughs> Hi, I didn't know if I had the loud microphone. Please <laughs> do, we need some volume. Um, my name's Tony Frohoff, and I'm the cetacean and elephant scientist for In Defense of Animals. And uh, basically, it's been a great uh, opportunity and tremendous pleasure to work with Courtney and Eileen and others here, many of you, uh, in working on elephant issues. Uh, I studied and did advocacy for dolphins and whales for almost 30 years, so now I'm really glad at IDA that we can create a, a burgeoning cetacean campaign and, mm -hmm. as I'll explain tomorrow, try to uh, connect some of the things that can help elephants with dolphins and whales and vice versa in our advocacy and our media. If everybody could just speak into the mic, we're getting it's inaudible. My name is Sangeeta Ayer, and um, I, am, I was a broadcast journalist in my previous life. Uh, after being 
a nature and wildlife journalist, I just realized that there was no opportunity for me as a journalist to present any stories because I would produce these stories and I would bring and give it and it would get relegated right to the bottom of the newscast and when there's something more important that 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 emerges my my report would never get aired and so I got really frustrated and I said we are actually living on this planet without a planet you can't have a TV station and so people just could not connect the dots and I felt that there was a significant um, disconnect between the way the media were presenting the stories and I knew I had to bridge the gap. So using my background as a journalist as well as my production skills, I ended up becoming a documentary film producer, again, nature and wildlife. And then I felt now it's my job to connect the dots and, and teach the media. And to a certain degree, I, I, I think there may have been some success stories in Sri Lanka as well as in India, and I'll share with you those tomorrow. But um, I think there's a really um, a lot of work to be done with not just what we are doing in terms of presenting the stories, posting them on Facebook, and having these kinds of conferences. Where is the media? Uh, they need to be covering these stories because without their presence, how is, you know, how, how's everybody going to, yeah, thank you for Danny's, you know, posting this on Facebook page and wonderful exposure that we are receiving. I would have loved to see CNN or ABC or NBC here because this is a vitally important conference because elephants are the gardeners of our planet. Without them, to a certain degree, we can't even breathe oxygen, you know, when you really think about what they do in the forest ecosystems. So connecting the dots was a thesis that I presented when I did my master's and I'm going to be exploring that tomorrow when I speak with you. I have an exclusive segment on how to engage the media and I hope I can give you some tips. This is Hi, I'm, my name is Colleen Plum. Uh, it's great to be here. I live in Chicago and I um, stumbled <laughs> completely into this. I'm an artist and I make photographs and videos and I, my, a project that I, for, and I'm going to talk about it this afternoon also and show you some of my work. But I started just with a very um, almost naive examination of how animals, with my photographs, w how animals are just completely um, intertwined in our lives. And even after making that project for 12 years, I learned that even that is a human-centric view, how they are woven into our lives. And so I've learned, I've just learned, learned, learned over and over all of these different things through going to, for that project, going to uh, meat packers or fur shops or uh, the circus. Um, and uh, just uh, that our relationship with animals, if you want to say non-human animals, is, um, is uh, defined by contradiction and that we love them, yet we treat them so horribly. So uh, then I started, when I did that um, series, I started with, I went to a circus and uh, that's where my elephant obsession began. <laughs> and so I've been, um, I made a video of elephants in 75 different zoos around the world. Um, after seeing stereotypic behavior once, I said, that does not look good. And I investigated and researched about that behavior. And I actually have researched so many of the people here it's kind of amazing to be here um, because I learned so much from all of the work being, that has been done before me about what this, what's up with captivity. And so then I, make, uh, I made a video uh, of, from all of these zoos um, of elephants exhibiting stereotypic behavior and I project the video now on the street. I've done it about a hundred times in, in many, many cities around the world. I just show up and turn on my projector and um, I was last night in downtown Portland, and that was really fun. And um, tonight I'll be at 20th and Hawthorne, and uh, there's a movie, it's like next to a movie theater, so there'll be a line of people. And then I just talk to one person at a time and say, uh, we have conversations. People are, ask me, what are you doing? Why are you here? What is, what is this? And they get it. People identify with the stereotypic behavior. They get it. They look at that and they say, huh. And then I get to, we get to talk, so it's really um, has evolved into a thing <laughs> that I keep uh, doing. So I, if tonight, late after the whole thing, go, come over to Hawthorne and Twentieth, and <laughs> you'll see.
Hello, I'm looking at all these amazing people on this panel. I'm like, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> My name's Tira Rudder, and I have a business called Art for Elephants. And I was like a lot of people, I'm just living my life, working a corporate job, and all of a sudden I'm like elephants. And that was it. Everything in my entire life changed. And I upended everything and sold every single thing I owned and moved into a 300 square foot RV and started traveling the world, talking every week. I've been on the road for two years at craft shows in the heartland of America, talking to people about captive elephants. And the thing that is so fascinating to me is how elephants are the universal language. People will come up to us, and we're talking, you know, this is Texas, man, this, you know, this is Price, Utah. I sold elephant art to an elder of the church of the Latter-day Saints. And they come up to you, these people that you think, oh yeah, they're, they probably, they go hunting deer every weekend, right? But they'll be, my grandma loved elephants, and I love elephants. And I'll say, well, don't ride them. And then they'll say, oh, well, why not? I rode an elephant when I was in Bali, and it was a really amazing experience. And you don't want to say, well, that was based on incredible cruelty. But so I've learned that the way to change minds is without shame. To, tell, to not make people feel shame. To make people feel shame is to make them dig in and to go, oh yeah, well, you know, screw you animal rights person, you are so high. But what I, so what I try to do is to educate people without shame. And to date, we've talked to over 62,000 individuals around the country. We've covered over 3,000 miles in our RV and we've raised over $26,000 selling art. And I'm just an average person. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Thank you very much. Actually, Tara, because of what you do, I'm just going to do a quick advert. June the 3rd, there's a chap coming to this, this uh, city called Earthling Ed. I'm proud to support him. He's an incredible chap. He goes all around the universities in the UK talking about animal uh, cruelty, etc. You know, it, look on Facebook, find him. Anyway, um, I hope we've got enough time for these because there's some brilliant questions. So, as concise as you can, please, folks. First one, I don't share animal cruelty videos on Facebook because it can scare people away. How can I share what I know and make a difference without showing the graphic videos? Who wants to take this one? I can so I have that policy too. And there is a place for graphic videos and what you guys do. It's really intense. But I used to work in market research. And one of the things, I worked 20 years in market research. And one of the interesting things that we saw was that, remember the, anybody of a certain age remembers the video where they're throwing trash at the ground and then Iron Eyes Cody is crying? Well, when we did the follow-up research on that commercial, we found that people who saw that commercial were more likely to throw trash on the ground because people are essentially lemmings. And if they, I mean, I'm sorry, but this is a room full of lemmings. And I'm a lemming too. If they see other people doing something, then they will do it. And so there are certain people, and sometimes people are living in a weird world and they see something shocking and it will change them and it will do really profound things. And that's what this is all about. But s sometimes when they see it, it gives them sort of a green light within that, oh, maybe I, like hunting people who are showing those trophy hunters, there's a certain percentage of people that are going to see those videos and go, wow, they shot a bull elephant. I'd like to do that. And so we have to be very careful and strategic when we are showing these images. Um, because we don't want to have unintended consequences. So I think that there is a place for shock, but it has to be balanced with positivity. What can you do to make a difference? How can you change the paradigm? What is a positive thing that you can do proactively rather than for some people just shocking them away from bad behavior? And what I said goes for everything is shame. When people feel shame, they dig in and they will defend their position, even if they're wavering. But if you come at them and say, oh, you're a horrible human, sometimes they'll go, no, I'm not, you are. You're a crazy animal rights person and I don't want you talking to my kids. But if you, I rode an elephant in India, okay, 20 years ago, I was on a tour bus, they got you off the bus, they put you on the elephant and up the hill you go. And I didn't know anything about it. So when people come up to me in my booth, they say, I rode an elephant and why shouldn't I ride elephants? And I say, well, there's, um, we're finding out now that it's not very humane and we advocate for humane tourism. And that puts them in a position of like, oh, this is new information. So they don't feel like horrible people. 
They want to do the right thing. Most people want to do the right thing, and they need encouragement to get there. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to also say that um, that we have found in our posting on Friends of the Park Zoo Elephants that the the happy feel good posts get far greater likes and more attention. So, um, so I would agree that that the happy ones are good ones, and and with those you can also impart a message. So um, I think there is, con it's, it's audience dependent. I think that, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist, so I try to educate. And sometimes we need to see, we need to educate with reality. And so if that is the reality, of course, but it depends on who your audience is. And so, yeah, it's, it, and also what is your goal? You know, do you want to get more likes on Facebook or do you want to motivate people to take action in a certain way? So it just makes a difference, I think, with uh, who your audience is and what your goals are. I just want to uh, second what you just said, Tony, because I think it's important to be objective. So I, I completely understand that, you know, gory images turn off people, but that is the harsh reality. At the same time, I agree with you that we need to, you know, post happy photos. There has to be a balance. And so that's where the objectivism comes to play as far as I'm concerned, where I say, okay, the images are graphic, so you choose to watch it or not, but this is what is going on in the background. And here are some of the things that we are doing to help end these atrocities. And if you're interested, please come and participate. So that's another way to to sort of, you know, let them know the, the reality, the harsh reality, because there's no, there's no need to hide that, because if you really hide that, you're, you're in a way denying, that's the way I feel, and I could be totally wrong, that's the way I feel, that if we deny the reality, then we are not telling them the truth, but we are telling them the truth in a manner that we are also offering solutions and saying that, you know, like you were talking about the scientific fact and being that objective, balanced reporting sort of thing. Thank you very much. Uh, this one's for Alan, uh, not just because he's a male, don't worry. Um, Alan, how to get local media to report on zoo animal conditions? I think you've been there. Uh, I'd hate to think that there's a formula for it. I mean, the, the title is How to Use Industry Tactics to Win. Uh, I never like to think we <laughs> industry tactics should be used you know, against me. What, I'm, I'm a sentient being, and you know I can I can understand the reason. Um, I don't know. I think I just think we have to be human about it. If if you want to build, uh, you know, good good news coverage, get get to know reporters. Or, you know, if you, if you can build a relationship, you can probably uh, get some response to, to story ideas. It, it's it's not a formula, and I think that if you come up with something that is too corporate, too slick, too manipulative, um, you, you, you go down <laughs> rather than up. I think one of the most important things you can do is build a good media list. And not only send out press releases, but also follow up with phone calls. Um, and sometimes you'll get a positive response and sometimes you won't. But um, you just have to keep picking away at it and just, just be relentless. And um, eventually you might find someone who wants a controversial story or a story that might get a lot of views because it's going to be about ele elephants and so people will watch. Um, you, just, you just have to hope. Um, you know, I think social media is, is a great outlet because you know, you're not at the mercy of, of, you know, mainstream media. But I do think mainstream media plays a huge part still in our society, and especially for, you know, parents, I, I guess maybe of a higher, older generation are still, you know, relying on, on mainstream media. Um, so one of the things I was going to say about, about our campaign in, in Seattle is that um, it spanned over, over a decade. And during that time, we were very fortunate to have the Seattle Times really help us along. They did 17 editorials railing on the zoo. They had 
so many articles. Um, we were very, very lucky. But it didn't happen right away. It took time and cultivating. And they changed different editors. And, you know, I'd have to spend two hours talking with the new editor. And, and it was just a matter of cultivating that. And so they, along with us, you know, change the public attitude. Um, so it, it really is essential to, to try to get them on board in some one way or another. And the, the thing I like to say is that although we did not get our elephants to sanctuary, what we learned, and just recently I, I did a public disclosure request to find out attendance at the zoo. And what I learned is over the 10 year period from 2006 to 2016, Attendance has been gradually going down, and membership has been gradually going down. Meanwhile, Seattle's population is booming. So, so public awareness has changed, and uh, the media is key, and being persistent is key, and getting on social media is key. But it, it's just it's a matter of persistence. I just want to add a couple of things, and those are all really important uh, points that they mentioned. But two key things. I really loved Matt's story about his daughter, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, talking about animal cruelty. I would urge everybody, being a journalist, for me, what really draws me is something really adorable like that. Like I was, I, my eyes were filled with tears when you when you shared that beautiful story, and so. Anything emotional, anything that involves humans. And the other thing that Julie mentioned also was when something is related back to humans, then anybody, you know, it catches anybody's attention, including the lawmakers, including the media. And if this is going to, for instance, elephants, you know, contract TB, which is considered to be a zoonotic disease, and there's, there are no there is no evidence to show that you know TB has been transmitted directly, but there is indirectly. And so some of those things that can be broken down from heavy scientific language to simpler terms, make them short, sweet, and concise. Let your sentences be 10 to 12 words, punchy, and make it interesting. Let the character be something like a beautiful child, like Matt's daughter and let it be anthropocentric, meaning related to humans, how it's going to impact human beings, then you can probably garner the support, plus build trusting relationships. That is so vitally important. I'd like to say also, one of the most effective tools we had, um, we did leaf lighting at the zoo during the summer, and um, one of the supporter's daughter, I think she was eight at the time, did a little cartoon booklet it was like four pages long it was so cute it would you know it was all drawn like a kid would draw it you know was a kid drawing it and you know it would have the elephant and and there would be the poop there and you'd see the smell of the poop coming off i mean a kid can really relate to that and um other times when we would leaflet, the, the zoo would like have a garbage can there or they'd say, you, you, you can drop this right here, you can, you know, we'll recycle it for you. But you can't take a little booklet with cartoons, you know, away from a child. So it was really effective. It was one of the best things we had. Yeah. I'd like to just add that I think that there's no fooling anyone in, in anything. I think the best way of communicating is through truth. Uh, through human um, just identification, I think that schemes or you know anything none of, it fall we we are inundated with information all day long, and if we see something horrifying or if we see some same old story about whatever it, we don 't hear it, no one hears it, so how to actually make it um, real you know what is that 's what I try mm -hmm. to do with my work is like what how can people actually see? Instead of me trying to convince anyone of anything, it's how can act people just a person, because we've been programmed. A society has pro programmed us, right, for generations about what, what our role is with animals. So we have to deprogram that and see what is going on. And I think that um, anything that can sort of do that without shock, I, I don't have a uh, big solution. I just think that that's the way to go. And then through children. Like, they, they see everything so truthfully. Like, they know, they're at the zoos, when I go, they're the ones who say, Mom, why is, why is that elephant doing that? 
And then the mom lies to them or mm -hmm. rationalizing and denial. So we've been taught, like, let's rationalize that this is, we're having fun and let's deny what we're actually seeing. So how to actually show people what, what really is going on to, and to be as simple as possible and I think direct um, is the, the way I think, think about it and through, through children, like maybe not lying to them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to the next question because it kind of links in quite nicely and I'm going to ask each panellist to give a, a brief uh, summary on this. I'll start with Tony because she didn't get a look in that time. Um, can you share tips or strategies to get favourable stories for animal issues or elephant campaigns? Well, that is quite the broad question. Um, I will be mindful of my time. I will give an example that it's a spoiler from my talk tomorrow, but uh, when we did uh, 10 War Zoos for Elephants, which is a list that In Defense of Animals has been doing since Catherine Doyle was there, and uh, a really great tradition, I received a call from a reporter or a journalist at Esquire magazine. And so he said, well, you know, this is, list is really interesting and I want to write something about it, but..." Elephants just aren't sexy. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I said, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I said, you know, okay, well, how can I help make them more sexy to you? And so he, I, I talked with him a little bit, and so I talked to him about work with orcas and the blackfish effect. And so I said, do your readers think orcas are more sexy than elephants? He said, oh yeah, orcas are really sexy. They're lethal and they're just super cool. I'm like, okay, great. Well, this is blackfish behind bars. And so he said, okay. And so he did a full page piece in, in Esquire about that. So in a sense, it's catering to what each journalist is looking for. And sometimes that comes together, and sometimes it doesn't. And I think I, one other point I would say is that I would really agree with a common theme that, that I think you just, uh, just addressed, is that so much of our society, including myself, there's a consensual or semi-consensual trance that we've all been in, a trance that we've been under and when it comes to other animals in many ways, other people, other human beings. And so we're slowly waking up from this trance. Um, uh, and so part of the media is so imperative for us to create these messages. But how we do it, I think, again, just has to be really piece by piece and knowing that people are at different places because you know we've all been in different places and I say in 20 years I'm gonna look back at some of the things I'm doing now and say wow how could I have been so ignorant so that's when you're talking about the truth that's that's the job I think one of the things you need to do is make the job of people in media easier so um, providing them with information you know um, I, I'm a big fan of doing public disclosure requests. I do it all the time. Um, and if you can give them a tidbit of interest that would spark a story, then, then you've saved them time. Or in your press release, if you have cite a source that'll make it easier for them or that they just grab a piece of your, pu pu of your press release to use, um, they're busy, they work long hours and under a lot of pressure. So any way you can make it easier, maybe a better likelihood to get a story. Alan? <laughs> I don't have a lot of wisdom here on how to reach reporters, but pictures are nice. Ch children like pictures and few words, and I think reporters may be like that too. You, you, we're talking about how do you get their first attention, and hopefully you can develop a relationship later, but a top ten list was a great idea for you know, the worst zoos. And, um, you know, if, if you have good photos, often, at least I know with my neighborhood paper, I love to print a photo. Um, You've got you to gotta go to the simple level like you'd, like you'd appeal to a five-year-old, we'll say. <laughs> yeah. Tira? Oh, how, is this the bad one? 
Well, for me personally, because I don't do any kind of, I don't have the budget or the time since it's just kind of me and my friends, I like to give people ownership of the message. So we have a bunch of little evangelists that go out and spread our message for us virally, who know that Art for Elephants is coming and they get really excited and we do kids contests and I do a little drawing lesson. I teach kids how to draw an elephant when they come up to the booth. And so I really, I let the message spread word to word person to person. And it's, it's, again, yeah, simple with pictures. So everybody feels like they're an owner of the message. I just say what I say, and then they take it, and they run with it. And they're doing these amazing things. I, there's a girl, a little child who's about nine, who does a thing called Faces of the Endangered. And she's, it's kind of irritating as an artist, because she gets a whole lot of attention, because she's nine, you know? But I mean, she's, she's just taken this and run with it. And anything like that that you can do, you have to lose control of the message, and you have to tell people you're empowered, and make this your message. And then it's weird, like I had a, I never did much of twi Twitter, my husband's a tweet because it scares me. And then suddenly Peter Fonda retweeted Art for Elephants tweet. And suddenly I'm like, wow, suddenly I have 500 followers on Twitter, how did that happen? You, all you need is one little crack, but the message wasn't mine at that point, it was then Peter Fonda's. And then it was that nine-year-old kid. And so part of it's just learning to let it go and let sort of the, the spark take over. Great. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, seriously, what is the question? Well, right. yeah, I, I, how how to that. how to get the media to be to have attention to what we're doing? No. Uh, it's second, luck. No, it's completely. <laughs> sorry. Can you share tips or strategies to get favorable stories for animal issues or elephant campaigns? I do. I think it's lucky. Uh, I think. Just that motto of "build it and they will come" is what I go to. I have don't I don't I I don't know. I feel like when I go set up things. I mean, I've had my work written about, and it always surprises me. And um, to think about it just energetically and l like let it f go where it's supposed to go. And I have to believe type that type of thinking that it will. Like, how did I end up here? You know, I don't. I didn't plan it. It just it happened and well I did I don't know whatever I I think that there's this woman who's but keeps interviewing me and it so I feel like we have to partner with people who do have a wider voice in different outlets and it's really exciting that, that she's interested in what I'm up to so um, then it's out of my hands too which is also it's kind of scary <laughs> what is she gonna say Thank you. hopefully she'll convey the right message Sangeeta yeah, I just wanted to say, the minute you say you have an exclusive photo or an exclusive video or something exclusive, it really captures the media's attention. For instance, using her own story about, you know, elephants being sexy, um, I actually captured a video of, an, of a bull elephant mounting a female and in, 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 at the Elephant Nature Park where they were doing it naturally. Okay, and so I'm, I'm sitting here, I have built this relationship with this vice president of news and um, he came to screen my Gods and Shackles documentary, he was impressed and we are discussing all kinds of stuff to the point that we are close to now closing a deal where we're going to produce a 26 part series on Asian elephants exclusively to be screened in Kerala. So I'm sitting in front of him and I'm saying, thank you, <laughs> but I'm sitting in front of him and I'm saying, do you want to see something? And this is like the vice president. <laughs> and I showed him this video and it's like a, it's like a t 30 minute, or no, not 30 minutes, sorry, 30 second or 45 second video. He's looking at it and he's like rewinding it. I'm like, what's up? And he's looking at it, he's rewinding. And he's like, I've never seen anything like this before. I said, this is how elephants are. Like they are, when you leave them in their natural habitat, you don't have to do any kind of forced breeding. Look at how they are. They, look at the male, how he's seducing her. Like I'm talking in human terms and I'm seeing like, and look at her, how they're chirping and how they're talking like, ooh, that was delicious. Like, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm giving him this empowerment, right? And literally that sexiness, right? And, and, and he's going to use that for this, for one of the six sections where we're going to talk about you know, how elephants mate. So it's like an exclusive video that I'm giving him. And so, and, and I'm, I'm giving him the human-based story, so that's kind of empowering him. And of course it is sexy. 
<laughs> so it's all about sex. <laughs> Tell that to the mother of a five-year-old. Okay, what tactics are not being used or employed enough to change the narrative prevalent in the public that zoos aren't harmful to the welfare of elephants? Free for all here. Could you repeat that question? That's yeah. a doozy of a question. Oh, my a long one, too. What <laughs> tactics are not being used or employed enough to change the narrative prevalent in the public that zoos aren't harmful to the welfare of elephants? Oops, that's the bad one. <laughs> I'll try. I'll, I'll try. So that's one doozy of a question. Um, honestly, I think that zoo culture is generational. And I think that people want to go to zoos because they have good memories of going to zoos. And so a lot of times we're looking for this magic silver bullet where the zoo has all this budget and they can promote that they're good for conservation and blah, 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 and all these things that they say. And we look at ourselves and we're like, oh, this ragtag bunch of you know, elephant rescuers and animal people and we don't have a lot of money and we don't have this stuff and how do we do it? And I think that, that really don't underestimate the amount of power that you have as an individual to make this like, incredible change. If you tell your friend that's, or a, a really good example of this is uh, recently there was someone whose school planned a trip to the zoo. Uh, and it was part of the class project as a reward. All kids want to go to the zoo. It's a field trip, you know? And a group of parents got together and they talked to their kids about why you shouldn't go to a zoo and they wrote a letter to the school board saying that why they wouldn't be sending their kids to participate in this school field trip. It's that kind of thing that is going to change people for generations to put that seed of doubt into their heads that the zoo really isn't a nice place. And you can do that with no budget whatsoever. You can do that with no media voice whatsoever. If your friends are going to send their kids to school, you can say to, to the zoo, say, don't, sit, don't let your kids go to the zoo and here's why. And why don't we have a day where we draw pictures of animals or a free day at the park where we look at the native wildlife of the squirrels and the birds. And that's how we can learn about animals. Animals. So these things really, we talk in really broad strokes of social media and media, but media is just people to people. And we are a lot, a lot more powerful than we realize. Right, I, I've, I've got one, one tactic, very simple. I, I, I'd approach a female reporter. I've found in the stories that I have done the only people who say you're writing too much about elephants are men. Most of the people who really appreciate it were women. Most of the people here are women. Most of the people in the panel are, are women. Yeah, that's that's the easier the easier way to get this thing going. I think uh, men are a little slow to catch up. Mm, yes. <laughs> uh, I I'd like to chime in and say that um, I think it's a matter of. Uh, presenting new ideas that uh, I don't think it has anything to do with the sex of the person personally. I just think that it's um, maybe women, uh, well, uh, that's a whole other issue. But I, I think that presenting the idea that we don't have, okay, so it was like Super Bowl Sunday and I was at my sister's and my sister-in-law said she was going to take my nephew to the zoo. And I said, hey, Laura, don't take Jack to the zoo. Maybe just don't. And I don't like to say, I don't like to tell people what to do, and I don't like to, I've gotten worse. <laughs> I've gotten more outspoken. I, so I spoke up and I said, maybe don't. And she said, well, how else is he going to learn how big a bear is? And I said, well, we don't get to see how big a bear is. We don't, why, let's think about that the notion of that we are supposed to know how big a bear is, is a new idea that isn't, if he lived in, in the, in, I don't know, in Yellow, near Yellowstone, or he might see a bear, and then he could have some reference, and that's where the bear should live. I mean, isn't that more educational? And I was all like, oh my God, I'm going to get in trouble for, you know, family. And... She actually was very receptive to that. 
So I went out on a limb to say, don't, maybe don't take him. And she was receptive, and I was grateful for that. And also to speak to what you were just saying, um, the class was going to go, my daughter's class, and I spoke up at a parent me meeting, and I said, there's other ways. And one of the other parents said, like, can, we, can the kids not go to the zoo for a field trip? And one of the other parents said, well, the Lincoln Park Zoo, they have, um, you know, good work being done there. And I said, well, there's other places to support, too, besides the zoo. And so let's give the zoo a message that we're not going to come until they actually do good work all the time, not just for certain animals. So they have to stop trying to fool us and seduce us into going because it's, it's false. It's like if they are going to actually do good rescue work, then do that only. And don't uh, pull us in with this baby polar bear or whatever because, you know, I think that's lying. In a manner that would resonate. So when you say hostile, well, they, they always like to balance the stories. And so if this is what you're trying to say, I, I completely understand what you're saying. Like, you know, you present a climate change story, for instance. You speak with a climatologist, a climate scientist who's got this wisdom, who's got this scientific wisdom, and then you go and speak with a denier to balance the story. And when, when, when the news media does that, then when you present the story, you know, you, you have a conversation with them that there is no... There is no controversy to this because all of the scientists that are experts in this field unequivocally they agree that this is happening. So when it comes to conservation, you say that hunting is not conservation, for instance. And then you say we've got elephant scientists who believe in this. So when you say when you say hostile, I, I really don't understand what you mean, but if you mean that they are trying to balance the story and talk about you know, because they want to be objective, they talk about the science as well as a denier who's got absolutely no knowledge but his own vested interest. So you kind of explain it to the media. And then what they do is beyond your control. So you just have to learn to let go, as, you know, she mentioned earlier. And so there's, I don't know if that answered the question, but I don't know whether the media really gets hostile. Um, you can build a good trusting relationship and you can, you can disseminate the information in a manner that would resonate with them, that would make it punchy, and that would make it important and urgent, provide them exclusive photos, exclusive videos and such. So those are some of the tips. I don't know about the hostility. I have not personally been hostile to anybody who brings me stories. I'd, I'd say there's some condescension. <laughs> if, yeah. if, typically, this kind of a story, if, if you talk about elephant welfare and a zoo is on the other side of it, the zoo will have ready experts on staff and they will sound like they are the experts to the reporter. And you know, the, the, the first blush is to say, you know, what, what do the protesters feel about this? And then what is the science on the other side? So it's very hard to get started and feel like it's fair. You know, you, you start behind and it, it may not be hostility, but it sure feels that way when <laughs> you're trying to get, get, get fair treatment and, and your, uh, you know, the assumptions are, are built in in favor of status quo and zoos as usual. Um, I don't know who asked this question, but I think any of you who've been working with, if you work with enough journalists or, or people in the media, there, there is a tendency to want to provoke a reaction. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's how I interpret hostility, perhaps, in this question. You know, it's just pushing, well, don't you think, or what, you know, just pushing and pushing and pushing. And so I think there's a point, uh, it's really, you know, exercising your own uh, composure backbone, you know, to stay to your, to your story and to stay true to what your message is. And so in that sense, because, you know, it's, it's easier for the journalist, I would think, if that's their modality to get some, if they get a reaction out of you, then it might make their job a little easier to sell that piece, so. Thank you. We've got one last yeah. question. Oh, oh, I, oh, I, sorry. Oh. Yeah, I, I agree that um, you have to keep your composure, but I think if you um, stick with the facts, always be truthful, you will gain credibility with the media, and over time they will come to you for 
an opposing or an, you know, a, a, another perspective on the issue. So I think it's just so important to, even if you want to paint the zoo in the worst light and, 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 and the least amount of space that the elephants have and, and how many hours are locked up every, every season, you know, every winter. Um, but as long as you're factual and as long as it's true and, or you, you can provide, like I say, if you do public disclosure requests and you can provide, look, this is what they actually said. This is their words. Um, you just have to build your credibility and, and it takes time. It does. Thank you, Aline. So, sorry to ignored you before. Um, one thing I would say is, uh, Courtney, could we have an extra hour next year, please? <laughs> thanks to the panelists and thanks to all the questionnaires. There is one final question which could almost be done with a straw poll, but, uh, and 30 years ago we wouldn't have even asked this, but social media versus traditional media. Um, so, if anybody really wants to dig into this, I really encourage reading a book called New Power, which is the power of spreading things in the hyper-connected world. And it was written by the guy who does the My Giving Challenge. And they, they track things like the NRA, uh, as, a, as abhorrent as that is to everyone I'm sure in this room. They're really effective at what they're doing. And so, I think that to make any effective change, it's going to be a combination of social media and traditional media. We're, we're at war, whether we like it or not, to save these animals and to save this planet. I mean, really, the way animals are treated in slaughterhouses and the way elephants are treated in zoos, there's no... There's no pussyfooting about it. This is life or death. And if we don't take action now, so it's like the ship is sinking and you grab whatever you can to get the ship to stay afloat. And it, if you've got social media, if you want to sign petitions, if you want to stand out and protest at the zoo, if you want to tell your coworkers not to ride an elephant when they go to Thailand and they ignore you and then they still do it, and if you want to stop eating meat, and if you want to do these, every single action we have has consequences and has power. And we have to do every single thing that we can do if we're going to save any of these animals. And it starts with us. I, I, I agree. I think both social media and regular media and... I think that, you, that was so well said. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to add that um, the combination of social media and the traditional media could be also a potent combination because you have a Facebook, for instance, and they, for instance, you have the deniers of the animal welfare movement or elephant protection movement that I'm trying to uh, create in India and then you have the vested interest that will try to character assassinate you and so you got to be watchful of that also and so I, I, I generally when I speak with the media in fact I've become so connected with the media that the journalists would tell me what to say and what not to say so I cannot stress enough building trusting relationships you know it's so vitally important and um, to ensure that both gets the coverage when you really consider the number of hits or the number of likes or the comments that comes on the Facebook it'll automatically draw the traditional media attention also and you can do the general traditional way of publicizing whatever you're doing through Facebook through media and I guess a combination of the two will probably empower our efforts well I also think both are very important and I think that um, there are powers, power in numbers, and if you um, can build your social media where you have you know, 10,000 followers, when you do meet with a politician, let's say, those numbers can translate into votes, and that's what they care about. So, you know, building your numbers through social media, I think, is, is critical. The, the message is really what matters. Um, social media may seem what the new thing now, it will be the old thing in another time. So if, if, if the message is powerful, 
that's what will work for you. Thank you all very much. Things that have been happening here. Uh, it's Jane Velez hyphen Mitchell, her public figure page, and then she's also janeunchained.com. So spread the word, and that's uh, what, what I'm doing here. Also, I'm Danny Rukin, and I post all the things that I do for her on mine as well, along with my activism. Thanks. <laughs>